Welcome back to the study of the book of Colossians. We'll begin chapter 3 finally today, which means we're at the halfway point. There's only four chapters in this letter, and we've covered the first two, and now Paul is going to begin to shift gears a, little, a bit in the last two chapters. You recall in the first two chapters, he dealt with doctrinal issues, primarily assuring us of our salvation. He laid the foundation that you and I as Christians have been fully accepted, fully saved, that we've been, quote, justified, meaning that our debts have been fully paid by Christ on the cross. So it's that now we have this often pri awesome privilege to be in fellowship with him, 7 by 24. Our old self has died along with the stain of our sin. So we're no longer separated from him. Colossians in chapter 2 to 6 said, You have been fully received. Now walk, now live with him. Likewise, Romans 6, 8, Paul said the same. Now that we have died with Christ, so now let's walk with Christ. So the question today, beginning in 3 and 4, is what does that look like? What is the practical application of this doctrinal fact? Let's take a look, beginning in chapter 3, verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Then verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Set your minds and your heart on things above. Understanding these two verses, family, are foundational to our Christian walk. Paul is saying before we even begin that walk, we must ensure our head and our heart are in the right place. He starts the verse with since then, or some translations, therefore. That always links to the previous passages, previous message. Since we have been fully accepted by Christ, we now can be in fellowship with him. The key word there, family, is that word is past tense, that we have been raised and accepted, justified. So it's our privilege, our blessing, to be in relationship with Christ, who sits at the mighty right hand of God, the position of power, that's a done deal. We have that relationship. We don't need to do anything but enjoy it. What an awesome privilege, he's saying. But he does say it should begin with something, a word he uses. And this word is seek. It's actually an action verb. And it's an ongoing action verb that we Christians should con continue to seek. It means that we are never fully going to achieve it, is something that we aspire to do. That, that seeking is something that we do with our mind, our reasoning, and also with our heart, our desire, our emotions. This word in the Greek, and seek, is the same that Jesus used in Matthew 7, 7. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. What are we to seek? Seek things above. That sounds pretty lofty, sounds a bit ethereal. Things above. Things above are simple. They're simply, we're to seek things that are right and not to seek things that are wrong. We're to seek Christ, his guidance on the right decisions of life versus the wrong decisions. Seeking things above simply means not seeking sin. Sin in the Greek means that we are missing the mark, taking a path that we were not designed to take. Sin is defined in James 4, 17. Let's take a look. Anyone who knows what is right but fails to do it is guilty of sin. Sin is choosing the wrong path, choosing a path that leads to harm, a path that's moving away from God moving away from his blessings. As Christians, we have a free will to choose our path every day. 
we can seek to be guided by God's wisdom or we can be guided by the world's wisdom. It's interesting that social scientists tell us that you and I make 70 conscious decisions every day, large and small. What time do we get up in the morning? What do we wear? What do we spend our money on? How do we treat people? What comes out of our mouth? What media do we consume? What attitude are we going to have today? Who will we marry? The decisions go on and on. Paul is encouraging us to learn to seek God's wisdom in all of our decisions. Somehow we think that following God's wisdom is a sacrifice. Yet I think if you, like me, if you review the decisions that we made when it was, quote, influenced by God, I guarantee you, you're never going to find, quote, a bad decision, wrong advice, just the opposite. God's advice will always lead us to an abundant life, a life full of purpose, joy, and peace for us and those close to us. Here's a couple proverbs to remind us about God's wisdom. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Commit your actions to the Lord, and your plans will succeed. So Paul is telling us in his very first verse on application, the first thing we're to do is to set our hearts, quote, right. Focus on things above. Why is that? Because from our hearts is where our thoughts come from, where our decisions come from, and our actions. Paul understands that our actions, our decisions, sum up our life. Again, look at Proverbs. As a man thinketh in his heart, he is. The theologian C.S. Lewis said it, frankly, much stronger. Let's take a look at his quote. Every time you make a choice, you're turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different than it was before. And taking your life as a whole, with all your innumerable choices, all of your life long, you're slowly turning this central thing into a heavenly creature or a hellish, hellish creature. This sounds a bit harsh. And in some ways it is. If we spend a lifetime making wrong decisions, we're going to live a wronged life. Paul is encouraging us to make, quote, the right decision, to seek Christ in our decision making. Let's take a look at verse 2 again as he amplifies that. Set your minds. In the King James Version, it says, set your affections. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. Earthly things. What are these earthly things? Paul's actually going to give us a short list in verses 5 and also verses 8. They include things like sexual immorality, evil desires, greed, rage, slander, filthy language, idolatry. Rather than focusing on things above, He's telling us to avoid those things. What are the things above? He gives us a pretty good idea in Philippians 4.8. Let's take a look at that. Fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise. Things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Paul is saying that our mindset, our attitude, is a choice. We can choose to have a mind of Christ. It's not easy. In fact, without the power of the Holy Spirit, it's impossible. Because we live in a, in a fallen world. A world where we still have our old habits of our, quote, old sinful nature. This process of learning to reject that old nature and choosing this right over wrong is a big word. We're first justified, and now we're in a process of sanctification. Let's take a look at that word, justification, sanctification, 
and glorification to make sure we understand. Under this heading for justification, it means that when we received Christ, he accepted us and fully paid for our sins. We were declared justified just as if we had never sinned. Again, as we keep saying, this is past tense. This was the message of chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Paul. Now we enter chapter 3 and we're talking about under the heading of sanctification. By walking with Christ, which is, quote, present tense, ongoing, we have the power daily through the Spirit to choose Christ over sin. Again, a process. Sin is still present in this world and we still have the old habits of our sinful nature, but we're no longer under the power of those habits or that sin. Paul noted this again in the last two verses, verses 1 and 2. We can choose through our mind and our heart to reject sin by setting our heart and mind on Christ. Then later on, when we look at verse 4, Paul will speak about the future, glorification. This means when, when Christ returns, he'll rid the world finally of the presence of sin. And he'll exchange our, quote, sinful bodies, the flesh bodies, for glorified bodies. So what is the best way to avoid sin? Walking with Christ daily. Strive to set our heart and mind to seek his wisdom in our decisions, including developing an affection for his word, affection for prayer, and affection for fellowship with fellow believers. Let's take a look at verse 3. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You know that little word, F-O-R, that preposition for, is used 7,000 times in Scripture. It amplifies the previous verse or verses. Again, Paul is reminding us, past tense, that our old self has died, along with the power of sin over our lives. When that old self died, that power died with it, with the indwelling of Christ and the Spirit of God. We now have a new life, born again in Christ. That we're born again, but we still are, that life is inside the old body. And Paul speaks of something that's hidden, he means that this new life cannot be fully understood unless you have the Spirit of God inside you to have discernment. Let's look at 1 Corinthians that explains that. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. This new life in Christ is spiritually discerned. Let's take a look at verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Here Paul, of course, is referring to the second coming. It's important to note that Paul did not say if. He said when. When Christ returns. Part of the mindset that Paul is talking about is us having a mindset that Christ will return. And he'll return at any moment. What if we knew he was coming back tomorrow? Would it change our mindset, our perspective, our attitude, our decisions? You know, when we focus only on this world, this world is our horizon, we tend to think of physical death as an end. But the reality is when we focus on things above, death becomes a new beginning. But this also should be a little concerning because it's also a, that new beginning will be a time of accountability. For, mo for us all, we'll be judged. And for, if you're like me, you're probably going to be judged that we stored up too many treasures in, on earth and not enough treasures in heaven. We're going to have some regrets that we miss the blessings of storing up those treasures in heaven. We'll speak more about that in verse 6. Let's look at verse 5 as Paul begins to 
shift gears again and get some really specifics as to what that walk looks like. Verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Paul again is noting that sin is a heart issue. That things like immorality or impurity or lust, greed, idolatry, they all begin in the heart. So that's what's not surprising perhaps is 2,000 years later, we're still dealing with those issues in society. These same issues are at the top of the list as a source of hurt, pain in our world today. Human nature has not changed. And this notion that somehow we're getting better, I would submit to you we're simply getting more blinded. Paul will issue us a warning in verse 6 that we all need to pay heed to. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Because of these, because of man's choices, that man has rejected God's love, his forgiveness, his wisdom. So there will be a day very soon when Christ says, no more. He will bring judgment and he'll rid the world of sin. The good news is Christians will be spared this wrath. Let's look first at 1 Thessalonians. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through whom? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in Romans, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But family, we are going to be judged even as Christians. We're going to be judged on the decisions that we made between quote-unquote right and wrong. Here's a couple of verses that explain that. They, meaning everyone, will face a reckoning before Jesus Christ, who stands ready to judge the living, meaning the believers, and the dead, the non-believers. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Again, family, this is not about our salvation. Our salvation is secure. But we will have to give a, a reckoning. We'll be required to give an accounting of our decisions we made regarding the things that God gave us, our time, our talent, our treasures. How did we use those? How did we invest those? Christ also amplified this in the book of Revelation, as well as the book of Luke. Let's take a look at those two passages. I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to pay each one according to what he has done. Then in Luke, then you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection, the second coming of the righteous. I know you often hear at funerals, the pastor saying that that person has gone on through their, quote, just rewards. That's not theologically timeline accurate. No one has received their rewards yet. No one has been judged to get their rewards yet. That will happen when Christ returns, when he sits on that judgment seat and looks at each of us and asks us to give an accounting of talent treasure and our time. Paul begins to close with verses 7 and 8. Let's take a look. You used to walk in these ways, meaning before justification, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself, put aside, of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. The key phrase in this passage is get rid of or put off, put aside. In the Greek, this has a special meaning. It literally means to take off or, and discard some filthy rags, filthy clothes that you're wearing. That we choose to take those off and put on the righteous robes of Christ. Again, a choice. Too often we as Christians, we can slip back on those, quote, nasty clothes. We use excuses. 
like, well, forswearing or anger. Well, that's just my nature. That's just my habit. Indeed, that's true. It was our old nature. But now you and I must make a conscious decision to put off those old habits, to rid ourselves of that nature. Paul uses verse in verse 9 for the sin of lying. He uses almost a complete sentence. So clearly that's an important sin that's frankly hard to get rid of. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Lying is one of the most difficult sins to break. Why? Because it's rooted in pride. It's a hard issue. The word here in the Greek uh, means something deeper than just offering a falsehood. The motivation behind this kind of lying is intent to deceive, to gain in your vanity, to look good. As Christians, we continue to struggle with this virtue called humility. We humans crave the world's applause. We chase after this applause and that by attempting to embellish the truth, the truth about ourselves. Paul is saying, enough already. Set your mind and set your hearts on the fact that the creator of the universe has accepted you. We don't need to find our identity and our security in the applause of other people of this world. Paul repeats himself in verse 10 just to amplify and have put off the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of his creator, meaning Christ. This is a beautiful passage. Again, Paul is reminding us that we should put on that righteous robe of Christ. And yes, he acknowledges that sometimes you and I will slip and soil those robes. And that's part of being renewed and growing. This word sanctification, its root word comes from this notion of being sanctified, holy, made holy. As we fall and Christ picks us up, and we repent, and we humbly ask for forgiveness, we grow. We grow in holiness. We gradually learn to be a bit more like him in the heart and in the mind. Paul will close this section with an amazing statement about the gospel message. Let's look at verse 11. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, which is a nomadic, warlike people, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Paul says the same in Galatians. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor free female, but you are all in one in Christ Jesus. What a beautiful verse to close on. That in Christ, there's no barriers. No matter your social, your racial, your political, your economic, your age, your gender, not even the, the depth of our past sin. He cited some brutal folks in that list. There is no barrier to his acceptance of us and his love for us. We all stand equal because we're all sinners. We all have nothing to offer but humility, gratitude, and faith. We'll close there and pick it up next week. Until then, may God richly bless you and your family. Again, aloha.